Well, let's call the meeting to order. Ms. Pacchio, can you do a roll call, please? Uh, yes, sir. Give me just a moment. All right. Uh, board member um, Hazelwood. Here. Board member uh, uh, Hotchkiss, who is not present. Uh, board member Payne. Here. Board member Roman. Here. Board member Winters. Here. Board member Davenport. Here. And board member, uh, or Mr. Chairman Hinchwood. Here. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Soup. Thank you. All right, the purpose of the meeting, policy of the Commonwealth of Virginia, the city of Suffolk is clearly stated in the Virginia Wetlands Act as follows. Shall preserve and prevent the despoliation and destruction of wetlands within its jurisdiction while accommodating necessary economic development in a manner consistent with the wetlands preservation. So the first thing I guess we ought to do is approval of minutes. You have elections, but we probably ought to do minutes. Does it matter? Sure. That's you fine care? as well. Let's do minutes. And I, um, as staff, I do have one um, comment on the minutes. Um, there are two um, public uh, members of the community that spoke, um, one of those being Ms. Taraski and one being Ms. Hangler. And at the time, we were not certain as, as to how they spelled their last names, and now we are. So I would ask if it's okay with you for us to correct the spelling of their last names throughout the minutes, if that's okay. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Anybody have any other corrections or additions or comments on the minutes? Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Second. All right. <clears throat> so next thing we have to do is we haven't had an election in a while, so we need to elect the chairman and the vice chairman for the upcoming, I think, our uh, bylaws say they are installed in July, but there is some confusion on some of that we need to probably clarify, but anyway. Um, yes, historically the, um, the election of officers has kind of varied in the past based on when the wetlands board had meetings, but I think moving forward, if, it, if we have the opportunity, we would like to do it um, in June so that it would go into effect July to the following June, so it kind of corresponds with the fiscal year. Um, but I think as long as it's done annually, we would still be okay. Okay. All right, so let's call for election of officers. Do we have any? Um, anybody have any comments or questions or nominations? I nominate uh, Chairman Hinchelwood to hold this position for the upcoming year. Second. Thank you. Do we need a voice vote? Um, sure. If we could get a voice vote on that motion to uh, re-elect uh, Mr. Chairman Hinchelwood as our upcoming chairman for the next year. <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. All right. That motion passes. Thank you. And for our vice chairman, I'd like to nominate Mr. Darius Davenport. Second. Second. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll call for the vote for um, vice chairman to uh, remain as Mr. Davenport for the upcoming year. Um, all in favor, say yes. 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 Or aye. Sorry. <laughs> all. Um, anyone opposed, say no. All right, thank you. That motion also passes by a vote of six to zero. All right, so before we get down to talking about this uh, document, there's one other thing that I, uh, it troubled me after the last public hearing. There used to be a statement I would read before the public hearing about if, if they didn't like the outcome that they could appeal it to them. So it was some legal statement, and I cannot find that in any of my information, but I do want to make sure we have another public hearing then I'll make sure that we state that so okay, people sure. understand what their recourse is. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I will I certainly find that. It, mm -hmm. But there was a statement that we used to make. Okay, yeah, I will look for that now too, um, okay. but I'll make sure we have it for the next meeting. Okay. And then um, I want to talk about this um, 
and I, I don't know how we want to do it, but I, I kind of was briefly talking to you in the, in the room, but I'll reiterate some of it, about the document that we created uh, as a wetlands board, as a city, mm -hmm. city of Suffolk. We created that document um, of what we consider a complete permit. And I just want to make a, I, I just have a little speech here that I want to go through so everybody understands where this all came from. Because I think Darius, you the only one that was here that was on the board that when we created this document no. and went through that, you Obviously. were, that's right, you were here. That's right. Yes, you were here. Okay. So, so first and foremost, as Darius told me one day, he said, the document's on the city of Suffolk letterhead. It didn't get there by accident. So it's, it was a document that we created in conjunction with the city of Suffolk. Um, our, board, our board developed the document in, con in conjunction with Mr. Scott Mills, who at that time was the planning director, and Miss Carla, I have Williams, but it, it was it Carter? <laughs> yes. Car okay. And who was the city attorney who was assigned to our wetlands board. And over several work sessions, and I'm sure the minutes are recorded and you can go back and read through them. Um, but it all culminated out of the River Bluff, Bluff Shoreline Wetlands Board Permit. And all, all the documents that we list that we would like to see, the environmental impact assessment, the um, restoration plan, the uh, erosion sediment control plan, we're not asking that we validate those plans. We're just merely putting a checkbox to say, these have been submitted and approved to you before a permit comes to us. And the reason we did that is because during that permit, it was a complete mess. None of those documents were available at all. Like I said, the, I think if I remember the the lady who we interviewed from the um, uh, public works said that the project didn't need an erosion and sediment control plan. And we were all just stunned. We were like, what are you talking about? And she was wholeheartedly, did, did, didn't need it. And so when there was no oversight at the end for us, and we always hear that, oh, well, yeah, yeah, the permit will be approved, you know, based on the fact that they'll do erosion sediment control plan and environmental impact assessment. Well, that project, everything, we found out that was not true. And so instead of everybody sitting there pointing the fingers at everybody, we're citizens. We don't really work for the city. We are giving our time to the city. So we worked with the city and we decided, the city included, that we would probably be the best ones to provide that oversight at the end. And so that's kind of where that whole document culminated from was so that nothing was missed by the time it got to us. And then when it came to us, all we had to do, if we had questions about the uplands or the impact assessment, we could certainly ask them. And if we needed to, more clarification, I'm sure we could go out to DEQ or DCR and get clarification on items. But it wasn't for us to evaluate those plans. It was just to make sure that those plans were available. And so that, that's kind of where most of that came from was so that we could work with the city to provide that citizen oversight to make sure all the laws were complied with all the way to the point where we are. Because everybody needs an erosion and sediment control plan and every project needs a, um, well, bigger projects need the environmental impact assessment. But anyway, <clears throat> That's kind of all I wanted to say about it. Um, Can I ask you to clarify something? Yes, sir. You said? <clears throat> Just want to make sure I understand. And I do, I do recognize the importance of all the things that they're supposed to provide, they provide. But did you say we're not supposed to comment on the quality of those documents? No. In other words, if we don't think the erosion plan is adequate, we're not supposed to? We, we oh, we no can comment on that. it, but we don't have jurisdiction. We have no jurisdiction over those plans. Our jurisdiction is very limited here. We're, we're in that mean low water to mean high. Now, if you look back, and, and 
as I had explained back in, what was it, 2012, Scott Mills had uh, queried the Attorney General on what our ju jurisdiction was and could be, and I think there was a 1984 case that they referenced in there that uh, they said that the, the Wetlands Board should look at the project overall and consider the overall project. Mm -hmm. But our jurisdiction is very little. Right. Right. It didn't say we couldn't consider it. Right. It just says that we don't have any jurisdiction there. Okay. So maybe my words were wrong, but certainly we can inquire about it and we can question it. But within our jurisdiction, is the quality of the proposal our responsibility? I mean, we, we're allowed to evaluate what they say they're going to do within our jurisdiction to make sure it's adequate? for what we believe is is inside our jurisdiction yes sir okay so, yes sir all right but like i said most of these plans the um erosion and sediment control all that's upward upland of us you, usually it should be <laughs> and so if it is we just need to make sure we understand that that plan was submitted mm -hmm. it has been approved for the plans that they're submitting to us tonight okay okay so not that it was a plan that they pulled out of a book from somewhere else, but it's the specific plan. Same thing with the Uplands restoration. And I think that's what Mr. Johnson was alluding to um, over there at Governor's Point, that he wasn't sure that anybody ever went back and actually made them do an Uplands restoration plan. It was said that the permits based on the fact that it would have one mm -hmm. And I think if I've understood him correctly, I don't think anybody enforced it at the city to actually have that plan done. Or if the plan was done, nobody enforced that it was upheld. Okay. It, but is there a possibility, I would assume, that the Uplands Restoration Project could have an impact on our jurisdiction Absolutely. area? Absolutely. So there, Absolutely. therefore, we ought to have, take a look at it. And even though it's not our jurisdiction, but but... You know, when that all comes crumbling down into, yes, into yes. our jurisdiction, then then we are concerned. Well, and and during that river bluff, just just like this project was talking about a two to one slope. Right. It's very hard to stabilize a two to one slope. Very hard to do that. And and so, when you look at that uplands restoration plan, that's what makes that two to one slope work or not. <laughs> so, and that's. Truly, that's what they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're the specialist in what all the regs for what they're supposed to do for uplands restoration, what they can do in the Chesapeake Bay protection area, all that. I mean, that's, they, they follow those regs. That's, and all we're doing is saying this checklist is just keeping citizen oversight to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing before it gets to us. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's, that's all this document was trying to do is, is also to protect the homeowner because we had a lot of people after we created this document that would come in and, you know, because you've asked some of the questions. What's your timeline? Right. And because and timelines weren't presented to us. And we're like, well, that's part of our gig here is we want to know what the timeline is. And is it realistic? And yes. And what happens if you don't make it? Uh, all those questions. So anyway, that, that's, that's why this document, that's why we created it, so that we could provide the oversight and kind of keep the city honest, keep us honest, and help the guy who's guy or gal coming to get the permit so it's streamlined. When they get here, we can make the decision instead of saying, ah, you don't have that, okay? Well, let's postpone it. Because we, as we found, you open a public hearing, you don't make a decision, you have 30 days, right? 30 days and then it automatically bakes in, right? Is that the way that works? So once the public hearing is concluded, um, it is a 30 day period. If, and if a decision isn't rendered in that time, then the permit is deemed approved. Yes. yes. Um, so one so of- So you have to watch yourself yeah. in these things. <laughs> and one of the things that could have occurred, I think, on, in the scenario that we had at the last meeting and, and I think it was impacted by the, the proponent's unfortunate delay. I, I know there were a couple of tunnels that were shut down, um, but it had the proponent realized that it might, he, he might want to um, 
continue the public hearing um, rather than have it completely closed, that might, might have changed the dynamic too, or a request that it be continued. And it, we would have still republished it, but then you could have had as a public hearing. So you can leave a public hearing open? It, it's not preferred, okay. but occasionally a proponent may say, kind of read the writing on the wall and say, you know, at this time, um, they, they may seek the board's approval to um, request, in, a, in essence, a continuance of the public hearing itself for a set period, say 60 days. Okay. You would still publish the public hearing again, and it would be a new public hearing, but that way you wouldn't have a situation where um, your proponents and your opponents to the permit have all testified, basically given their um, positions, mm -hmm. um, and then all that would, would, would remain was the discussion, which you can also table the discussion as what happened in this circumstance. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, it was handled exactly correctly under the circumstances. Yes, yeah, sir. I, and I just, like I said, it, we have to be careful on, on, and that's, this is a big project that came before us. We haven't had a big project since probably 2012. <laughs> so we get the homeowner project, and you don't want the poor homeowner to have to come back in here two, three times, okay? The developer, you still don't want the developer to do that either. It's their time and money too. So as a board, we like to have a full consensus, you know, a group, so that we have a voting, and and because when people show up, we want to be able to make a decision. That's our job. That's our responsibility, is to make decisions on their projects, not table it and say, well, we'll get back to you, <laughs> or hey, we want different information. This was a way for us to say, well, if you come in here with all this, we're going to be prepared to make a decision tonight. So I think just, just to quickly underscore what Chairman Henselwood is, is talking about. Through the River Bluff project, we learned a lot. It was a large project, it took place in multiple phases, several months, you know, what years, you know. And through that process, other public or smaller private homeowners were coming in and requesting their permit approvals as well. And so as we learned through the River Bluff project, through all those phases, you know, looking upland, looking down, in, in, into our jurisdiction, what are the components of a successful application? And so that's when we began to work on this document. How can we provide either a developer or a homeowner, basically the roadmap that lays out what are all the components that we need to make a determination and what are all the components that are needed for even city staff to make a determination on one of these permits? And so Basically, you know, what you're looking at, you know, these are the items that we feel this is what a successful application is made of. If it has all these components, it has the diagrams, it has, you know, the scales, the directions, it should be a successful application and everyone should be able to do their jobs and more permits should be successful. And as the chairman mentioned, you know, we don't have to send homeowners out do it again. We don't have to send, you know, developers out. Do it again because with this guidance, they should be able to provide everything that staff needs and everything that the board needs to one shot, one kill. This is what a successful application looks like and, and we're done. So. And we have rejected quite a few in the past. So it, it has precedence. <laughs> and they were homeowners, right. if I remember correctly. But... And I'd also note that the, after this document was published, the quality of applications that we received Absolutely. increased dramatically. Even the homeowners, if even they just drew things out by hand, it, was, it allowed us to be able to, you know, especially if we didn't go out for a site visit, understand this is what the project is supposed to look like. This is the timing and sequence of it. Because these things are important because a lot of times we're talking about uh, as far as, you know, even um, living shorelines, you got to have timing for things to grow, take root. Um, and if that sequence is off, you know, you're going to seed in the wintertime, you know, that's not going to, it doesn't make sense. And so it allows us to evaluate those kinds of things to make sure that this project is going to not just 
a successful application, but a, a successful project as well overall. And so, um, so yeah. And, and on these bigger projects, um, you know, one of the things that we, when we went through that discussion years ago about this document was, as, as a wetlands board, we never see the end product. We never see it. We all never see, never see the end. The end, right. We never see it. We never hear about it. We, nobody, because if it's a successful project, <laughs> nobody's going to come back in and toot their horn, right? I mean, if it's a bad project, somebody's going to come in and complain. But so as a board, we were like, well, damn, did that one ever turn out successful? And so the city, they were staffed a little, probably had a little bit more staff to them, yeah. but they used to go out because we would request, hey, can you get pictures of that final permit? You know, a year later, they'd come back with an update. But I can tell you on a permit uh, that as big as it is coming back with, uh, with that particular project, we're going to require some periodic updates. And I think, I think that kind of was the only way we kept that Project River Bluff on track was we kept getting updates on it. <laughs> even, even after, well, it was two years later, we were still getting periodic updates because it was such a complex project. Is there a process to do that? Or was that just kind of because you requested it? <clears throat> we requested a it because it was such a mess. We requested that mm -hmm. we get updates, every, what was it, every six months? So. Something like that for two years? Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure we didn't want to take our eyes off the living shoreline. We wanted to make sure that grass got started, everything got started like it was supposed to. Right. And I think part of our concern there was they got started later in the year, and we were concerned that the grasses weren't going to survive. So we wanted to make sure for that two-year period that those grasses were going to survive. But, but shouldn't any project that we approve be checked to be sure they did what what we approve them to do. I mean, if I'm nobody sure ever goes out and looks at it, whether I, it's just look, an individual sure homeowner. Do, but we don't. Well, I mean, is I, that part <laughs> of your normal process to six months, 12 months, whatever it is, to go look and see, did they follow the instructions? Like our friend over in, what's that area called? The, the guy that has the- Burbage Grant. Burbage Grant. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, like- We got him fixed up. Yeah. We, I, matter, matter of fact, we don't that know. was a feather in the cap to all of us the way we got that taken yeah. care of, I think. But, but is anybody following through to make sure he does what he's supposed to do? <clears throat> and also the Uplands folks were supposed to look at that because that's where the big problem was. I think moving forward, as long as the same folks are involved, we would like to do progress reports. Um, I'm kind of posing this question to you all to think about, but perhaps as conditions of approval with any application, you can specify when you would like a status update. Um, I hope that that would be within yeah. your realm. And, and like I said, for most homeowners, it's a one-shot gig, man. They come in, they're in and out, and, and you know it's a done deal. It's not a very complex. But when you got, when you got, com well, you know, that oyster project that come in here, the, the oyster uh, that, um, Jim um, Bay Environmental. Jim, um, good friend of mine too. I can't remember his last name. November? Yeah, they came in. They were doing some oyster castles on a high fetch bank for a guy. Right. Off and, and it's. I talk with Jim all the time, so I he's sent me pictures of those oyster castles. Is what it looked like, but you know that's another project that we ought to sing about because that's another successful project that was unique. That was approved with. Uh, there's supposed to be an update on that one also. I believe there was. We left conditions on that. Yeah. Yeah. But then they did another one out there at um, Windsor Castle Park that I went out and looked at. They did another one out there on the side of that bank just like it. So. But are you saying, Amy, at the time we approve uh, a project, an application, we should specify to you we would like a progress report at X times? Uh, you know, halfway through at completion. Uh, if if that's what you all collectively yeah. decide, then you know I'm supportive of it. I think it does vary probably project to project, um, unless oh, yeah. unless you think that there are standard.
times that you would want an update, maybe at the 50% completion mark and then when it's 100% complete and then maybe one year later. Those are just ideas, um, but it's ultimately up to you all and we will be happy to go back out and take a look and provide pictures at you know subsequent meetings. Oh, I like what you said about the 50%, because it's gonna vary depending on what the project is, how long it is. So 50% at a completion, I don't think I need a year then a year later, because like the guy's not going to go back and well, I mean, and change it. If, but I'd like to um, see if it that happens completion. to be some plantings. You're going to want to make sure the plantings well, survive true. that year. That's true. That's and that was point. kind of our our thing with that river bluff was we didn't think they had the elevations right to begin with, so we were concerned that the vegetation wasn't going to hold. But from what I understand, it is, Miss Miss Tarowski, um told me that what the lady had said here wasn't exactly true. Something that the living shoreline part of it, the grass is really heavy. Okay. Now there are some cutouts here and there, but she said that. that mostly it's it's held together. Now as far as the bank, all bets are off, man. People's houses, you know, that's old that's a different problem. <laughs> but um so yeah, we would probably specify um updates periodically on a project this big absolutely pictures are great but i'd even like to go out and look depending on the size of the project you know I think this as long is part as of my we, education i think as long as we can notify the property owner then in advance then that would probably be okay because okay. i mean one of them just comes to mind like the, the that doctor that was going to put a breakwater in can't think of his name remember the dr bear was that it Isn't that no, the, he was Indian, or or maybe did he ever one. submit the application for that? I wonder. I went out and looked at the property. He was there, and I can't. I, I think I was with Kevin, and he was going to put a, a breakwater. Uh, he's on the Nansman River and very expensive houses, and he was going to put a breakwater out so he could do a living shoreline behind it. And he was trying to get his neighbors to to do it. It doesn't ring a bell. I'm not aware of that background story. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't me at all. Huh? Really? Uh-uh. She's like, yeah. I mean, it's, he, I think he's a gynecologist, actually. Can't think of his name. No idea. Huh. I, will, I will find out his name. All right, so are there any other undiscussed concerns that either you or the city attorney has on any of this document that we have? Can this document be updated? It needs to be. Well, I have <laughs> a couple. I'm sure I, the fee is not three hundred dollars anymore. Yeah, I have a couple <laughs> of suggestions. Uh, in the uh, Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act part, it, it could add a new paragraph twenty-seven uh, that implements uh, some of that uh, changes made in twenty twenty by the General Assembly. There's something to the effect: if there is the intent not to use a living shoreline, uh, the developer needs to provide the scientific rationale. Hmm. And, uh, and in the, the other one that and is... That, that's in the Virginia statute? Yeah, that's in the statute. Okay. Right. And the other thing that's in there, um, which would be uh, 2028, uh, is that uh, the uh, developer should provide an assessment of the impact of sea level rise. And that's also in the statute? That's also in the statute. And what I thought might be helpful to the people using this, if you go to the tidal wetlands guidance that was written by VMRC to implement those statutes, uh, on page 9 through 12, VMRC lays out their specific criteria on how they want that done. So I would attach that as enclosure one to this to regurgitate back to the person doing, okay, here's what they really mean by this, and here's what they do. Well, we should probably, if we're going to do that, we should probably know what the statute numbers are and all that stuff so that we can make sure that we're in compliance. Okay. Compliance. Yeah. The, uh, just directed by the 2020 stuff. amendments to... Funny symbol looks like paragraph 28.2 dash 104 dot one. 104 what? 
Yeah, 28.2-104.1. And that's state code? Yeah, Code of Virginia, the Virginia Marine yep. Resource Commission. Okay. Yeah. That's the C level. One. I'm not a lawyer, though. That's the C level. <laughs> one. I'm assuming that there's two of them you mentioned. Was that the one for the C level? Yes, that's, that's yes. They're both in, included in that, oh, in the oh, in that area. Okay. Both of them are in that. That's where those uh, additions that were made by the General Assembly in 2020. You know, which is normally you say you must use the living shoreline. Well, the, for us, if they don't use the living shoreline, we need some scientific rationale for that. Well, now, the, unless the law changed, that if it's over, what's the magic number? Mile? Fetch? Oh, fetch, it's like three miles. I is think. it three miles? I think so. If it's over three miles, it's not conducive to a living shoreline and that you don't have to. Yeah, I, I think yes. There, there's a magic number there, and I'm not. I don't yeah. know that that has changed. So, that, I don't believe that's changed either. Then maybe what we ought to do is see if we can get um, by the next meeting, if we can get that Virginia changes whatever they've made, so we make sure whatever we come up with. I'll, I'll definitely take a look at it and and advise the the board. Thank you. Prior to the next I, meeting, I pro I'll provide that to staff. And then they can provide that to the board in advance of the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's great, Jim, for, for bringing that up because the more we can provide the builder, homeowner, whatever it is, the, the, better, the more satisfactory the result's going to be. Well, and most normal humans don't keep up with these law changes. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so. It's, it's only a, a certain sick few that do. <laughs> uh, um, with regards to uh, the need to describe why a living shoreline isn't conducive, that is um, something I'm really familiar with and um, that I absolutely would like to see that as part of the application. Now, the JPA itself already includes a section on that, and so usually folks have about a paragraph that they provide as to why a living shoreline isn't being proposed. Usually it think it's things like the width of the fetch or the existing elevation or slope, things like that. So usually it's just a narrative. So um, when you say scientific, um, you know, research as to why it wouldn't be conducive. A scientific rationale. That's what it says in law. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to know. I mean, if it's a, if it's a, you know, an administrative problem like the fetch, well, that that answers that question. But if 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 they don't have an administrative out, then you know, what is the scientific rationale? All right. Is there anything else we need to discuss on that topic? None here. None there. Can I quickly ask uh, when you talk about um, the uh, what did you call it? Oh, River Bluff. Where, where is that? Hill Point. Um, so Hill Point Road. If you if you're going across the the Nansman River Bridge, there on 58. I think that's 58, right? Yeah, that's it is, right, right. And you Before look to you your to right, 10. it's that whole crescent with all the houses up on that big bank yes. that, that has a really steep slope to it. And I think there are docks every 50 feet now. There are a lot of docks on it that weren't there when, when they started. But the docks weren't part of I mean, that's VMRC stuff. That's not our stuff. So this river bluff was passed years ago. This was. A I think it was situation. around 2012 or so, so it, when all that stuff started. Okay. 2011, 2012. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was way back, and like I said, it was a, a truly a learning experience for the city and us, and I think we all benefited from, spending. It, I don't know how long we spent afterwards we had doing all this. It had to be a year. Right. Late, I mean, we, we late nights in the old building. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we would interview the the various departments of the city on hey, why wasn't there an erosion and sediment control? Where, why wasn't there this? And they'd come in and talk to us about it. Since then, um, there's not been a very 
the one we're dealing with right now that's been shelved or withdrawn, that was the biggest project that the wetland board had dealt with. And Probably now, the now biggest the one in, since that time, yes, okay. ma'am. Most of them have been individual homeowner permits. Um, the one in Bennett's Creek uh, where decoys is was a pretty significant Yeah, that was a significant one, but that was a pretty easy permit, what they were doing. They weren't doing anything really exotic there. So the the application that's been the application that's been withdrawn, does that mean they are reassessing on on the grounds of all this, and then they'll <coughs> submit again? Is that correct? Um, correct. What I um, was told by the applicant is that they're considering potentially um, including some breakwaters in their application. So they're going to start from scratch by submitting a new joint permit application and new drawings and everything um, to come back before the Wetlands Board for consideration as a new request. And if you could provide Mr. Simon this document, I'd appreciate it. I I'm sure he has a copy of it. but. Um, I spoke with VIMS about this project because I needed some clarification in my head on some things. And as I got speaking with people at VIMS, I got with Lyle Vernell, who is the one who I found out that after our meeting, Bob Simon actually reached out to VIMS himself the next day. And Lyle came down and he's working directly with VIMS. Um, I, I talked a lot with Lyle about the document that I had referenced last meeting. And he says, man, we write so many of those documents. He goes, you know, they're just guidance. I said, I get it. It's, it's a starting point. But, you know, and he, and he defended all that. But he's working with Mr. Simon. I am confident that Mr. Simon will present us with a, uh, a much nicer project than was presented here that evening. Mr. Simon's always done a, yeah. a very professional job to our board, always. So I don't expect anything less. That was quite an anomaly. <laughs> so anyway, so yes, it is moving forward, and they're taking the effort themselves to, after our discussions. They took it apart. One big point that might be uh, still an issue is the Bleak Horn Creek and how that could be addressed. Um, there is a lot of uh, well, once worry again, right now. There's a lot of slurry going in. There's a lot of um, a disturbance of the creek happening as we speak. And, uh, and see, unfortunately, since there's no construction and no permit in the wetlands, it's really outside of our jurisdiction. Now, yes, it is of concern. And we've heard the people's concern, but it is not within our jurisdiction to take any action. Now, there have been enough people screaming about Bleakhorn Creek and enough people discussing it, and I think I'm sure there have been consultants and everybody else involved in it. So I, I anticipate, I think Mr. Winters gave me some DCR information there on it. I'm sure the core, I'm sure DEQ, there are other avenues to go through that that's their jurisdiction. And, and it'd be best to take it up with them. And like I said, we're sympathetic and empathetic to it, but it's really outside our, unless they are going to build on that side and come back with the wetlands permit, it's really not. The only why I'm concerned about it is the, um, Anybody that's done a riprap or even, you know, mess with the shoreline, that gets impacted. It just washes down, 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 down. So it's having confidence or the builder or whoever's doing the job to almost guarantee, and can they, I don't know, that that doesn't silt up because of a change in the well, as, shoreline. And as it's I was a saying earlier, um, at one point, and it's only because I deal with um, stormwater permits in my business that I'm familiar with a lot of the Clean Water Act permitting. But at some point, DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation, was in charge of 
the general permit process for construction, the general permit for construction. They were the ones that were, I don't know if they're still involved in it or whether they kicked it back to DEQ. It's a, it's a football. They kick back and forth periodically. But whoever's in charge of the general permit for construction is the one that you need to get involved in the erosion and sediment control plans, the BMPs, all the things that should be in place to protect that creek. Okay, so there is an agency. And I'm sure the city of Suffolk has some jurisdiction and authority there, but the people with the big hammer are going to be the state agencies. The only reason I am hanging on to it is uh, because of Google Maps, and you study the last 30 years and what's happened to that shoreline. It is amazing. Somebody does something, it impacts. Somebody does something, it mm -hmm. impacts. So somebody is inheriting and somebody is losing as somebody messes. And uh, <coughs> this bleak horn possibly could just get silted up simply by whatever is put out there. Mm -hmm. And then you've you've lost your your waterway, or and it's not so much to preserve for people's uh, waterfront. It's the fact of the you've messed with the ecosystem straight off by putting in the wrong stuff. And, oh, it, it's uh, similar to yeah. the other problem that gentleman has that I met. Is it Lim? Was it Lim, Mr. Barry's neighbor? Yeah, let me Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, Mr. Lewis. Um, has a freshwater pond right there adjacent to this property. On the other side of his property is where they dug this big BMP. So it has adversely affected his freshwater pond. Now, as a citizen, I'm concerned about that, but as a wetlands board, there's nothing, that's way outside of our jurisdiction. I don't even want that headache. But he needs to speak with the right agency to make sure that that was done in conjunction with all the current laws. I mean, there's, there's, I would think DCR, if that's who came out and spoke with the NRPA, you probably ought to start with them. Or if not, VIMS. You know, VIMS is another, uh, they're all over this particular project, okay, right now. So if anybody has any concerns, they probably ought to reach directly out to VIMS while it's a hot topic. Mm -hmm. And maybe all of this can be looked at holistically. Okay? But no, I, it's a very, you know, all this stuff is very sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, you're right, anytime anybody does anything. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's <laughs> that was our biggest concern yeah. I went back and was looking at a lot of the River Bluff or Hill Point documents, and one of the things that stuck in our craw, and I'm sure it never got stuck in the deed, was that we wanted to make sure that whoever bought the property knew that they had to maintain that living shoreline. Because we were scared that Darius was going to say, Psh, I'm going to go put my rip rap revetment all the way down. And Jeff's going to say, well, I like my little critters. I'm going to keep my grass. Well, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So we actually tried to get them to put that in the deed. Now, they all promised it was. Now, whether it was or not, I, I doubt it ever was. Yeah. But we were very concerned about that, that once we turned it loose with 1,400 or however many linear feet of shoreline, that every homeowner was going to say, well, hell, I don't have the money to do that. Okay, yeah. so, and we've got to pay attention to that on this project. Once it's turned over, I mean, those are all things on these larger projects that you've got to think about is how is it going to be maintained so that that wetlands does thrive or survive? So, and that's why those two to one slopes to me are very tricky. That's <laughs> um, it's, right. a, a very steep slope. I am informed. <laughs> What's that? I am informed. <laughs> Can't fight everybody's battles, but well, it no, just seems you, a shame. You, it, it's, we have it's to be very game, particular here because we have a very yes. thin level yeah. of jurisdiction, and it's too easy for us to get sidetracked. 
and there for years we tried to allow uh, public comment people to have public hearings anytime we wanted to just have people come in and five minutes of fame to come in here and, and city shot us down and we argued and bitched but we really wanted it and I think in the end it's probably a good idea we didn't okay because we would end up with this well, with that we couldn't do anything about yeah and and that would just frustrate the citizens but and, but you said the right word holistic if this is the last chunk is it the last chunk on this part of um, the Nansamon, if you look at a map, what's left? You know, <clears throat> if something is left, it's either been bequeathed to the state by whoever, and then you've only got some pockets left. So the development's already there. It's already impacted. Everybody's impacted each other, and now you've got this one big chunk. Who's going to really, you know, get impacted? It, it's, it's, like you say, to see it down the road two and three years. I don't want to say, well, I told you so. Did it wrong. Um, it, it's just. Um, we were all you know, cautiously sure. optimistic with River Bluff. And I, I think over the end, the shoreline survived. I don't know that the people's houses will. But that, once again, is outside our jurisdiction. As long as the bank exactly. yeah. doesn't fall into the river <laughs> or uh, the house. <laughs> So just changing briefly, I have one uh, little subject matter. Back in November, there was a homeowner that came forward and um, uh, in off Nansman Parkway in a development um, <clears throat> before Route 17, before you go on Route 17, way back, and somebody had put a new house, I believe, there. How did that go? How did that... Uh, it, it was approved and it was a very ambitious, uh, meaning the homeowner was doing the right thing and it was, I read, I actually got the documents and thought, good luck. I'm glad you're doing it, In but November. good luck. You might have, um, they, they did the right thing. I might not have been here at that meeting because November is usually my honeymoon. November, so uh, December. You were probably in charge. You remember? <laughs> and it, it was an interesting one because it was a house that had been put in there. And I don't think the homeowner realized what he was getting into, but did the right thing to submit very ambitious stuff for oyster this and sandbank this. And when you go out there and you look at the, again, the fetch, the, the angle, and you think, well, okay, are you willing to do it? Then go ahead. I, I'm just wondering how successful they were. I mean, it's early days, but it was uh, an interesting um, homeowner's I should have brought, brought you the did the there. oyster castles? The Sorry? The, the one who did yes. the oyster castles? Yes, I think it was. Uh, okay. Everything imaginable they were going to yeah, do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean... It's very noble, very noble. As far as I know, when I spoke with Bay Environmental, that the oyster castles are doing pretty well, but... I. My next meeting, I'll have. I, I know Jim pretty well. I, can, I know that as I spoke with him about that project offline, he was talking about one he was doing out at um, the Bay, uh, Windsor Castle. They did one just like it out there, probably a little bigger. So, yeah, because that guy was trying to stabilize his big pines. They were all caving in. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Very good, well presented. Yes, that's that right. Because they, he ended up getting him a grant. I think Bay Environmental put in, and they got it. I do remember that now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Well, let's make a motion to adjourn. We got one. Move. Second. Second. All right.